Hi, third year students. I hope this finds you well. As I told uh, other students, it's uh, very difficult to, to deal with uh, any topic today because of what's happening, of course. It's very difficult for anyone to, to think about doing any kind of job, any kind of activity without thinking about the big monster between quotation marks, of course, that we are all thinking about today, the coronavirus. But still, I believe that we have to do some activities, including, of course, some lectures, the, the lectures that I'm going to deliver to you from now on, but also I believe that you have to seize the opportunity of the confinement to read, to read books and to read online articles, serious articles, novels, etc. This is an opportunity, so you have to to try to uh, benefit from this opportunity, I believe. It's not the end of the world, it's going to be over soon, I hope, uh, but you have to try to, 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 to get the best of it. Uh, so uh, so you have to read, you have to talk mainly about our topics, of course, but you have to read any other thing, but you also need to read more about uh, our topic. And uh, this topic that we started in the, since the beginning of the semester on the Cold War period in the United States, as you know, when we covered, we have covered a number of lectures on the Vietnam War and other topics. And uh, we were supposed to move to another topic and another important movement that uh, took place in the United States in, during this period between, as we said, the end of WW2 and the fall of the Wall of Berlin and the fall of the USSR. And that's the period, of course, that's supposed to be called the Cold War in the United States. Today, I'd like to talk to you about the civil rights movement, another very important historical movement uh, that took place in the United States. I believe it's very important not only for the United States itself, it's uh, an experience, it's a human experience uh, from which we could draw lessons. I mean, uh, were, whether, were we American or from any other nation in the world? Of course, the, the civil rights movement probably already know that it's about the struggle of the uh, African Americans, those people that we studied, uh, uh, and how they, uh, they we studied how they arrived to to the to the American continent from Africa, and the, uh, they were enslaved mainly by Europeans, and they were brought to 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 to, to, to the United to the United States and to the American continent. A lot of tragedies throughout the centuries of history, but still. Uh, um, part of these tra uh, tragedies took place uh, during the civil rights movement. And officially, uh, it is actually uh, uh, the period between 1954, 1955 to 1968 in the United States. There are a lot of lessons to be drawn from this period and from this movement, I believe. And uh, uh, of course, uh, you may uh, wonder what does this period and what do, does this movement uh, have to do with uh, what does it have to do with the Cold War between the two blocks that we talked about, the Western Bloc and the Eastern Bloc. Of course, in addition to being uh, a period that is included in this uh, uh, Cold War period, of course. It, uh, of, uh, the civil rights movement, which is a domestic affair inside the United States, had also its international impact and its international, probably, influence. Uh, other states, you know, uh, other states used to to criticize uh, the United States because of what was happening inside the country, mainly how uh, uh, white people treated black people inside the country, so it was an affair that had also some international dimensions. But in addition to that, it was also, of course, uh, an extremely important movement that had its impact on domestic affairs, on domestic policies and politics, um, so I believe it's important to study this uh, movement. Uh, as I said, uh, it's actually between 1954 and 1968. What happened? I'm going to try to speak about what, what really happened 
But before we speak about what really happened, we have to speak and the results of that. We have to speak about the situation, trying to describe the situation of African Americans in this period. The situation, well, we know, of course, from the very beginning, and of course, there was, of course, a wave of, uh, of uh, migration, a wave of trade, slave trade, uh, the very famous uh, slavery triangle, England, Europe, Africa, United States, and thousands and thousands of uh, uh, Africans were brought uh, to America. In spite of themselves, of, of course, there's a, a very famous, probably, uh, quote uh, that says, I don't know if it goes back to whom, but it, it says that the only people, the only race, the only probably minority that exists in the United States and which uh, did not choose to be in the United States is uh, African Americans. The, all the other communities probably chose to be in the United States, but African Americans were brought there in spite of themselves. They were in bondage when they were brought there. So, um, I said, uh, uh, there was, of course, another important that preceded, I'm going to speak, so in the beginning about the period before the civil rights movement and trying to give you a description of the situation of African Americans before the civil rights movement. Of course, it was a very negative situation. It was a very, uh, let's say, disadvantaged situation in terms of rights, in terms of human rights, in terms of civil rights, in terms of political rights, and in terms of uh, living conditions, for sure. So uh, we know that there was a big war that took place in the United States in the 19th century, between, 19, uh, between 1861 and 1865, and it was called the American Civil War, and one of the main issues uh, of that war was slavery question of slavery, whether to abolish it or not, because there was a movement, a world movement, an international movement towards the abolition of slavery at that time. And we know that slavery was abolished after that war, with the 13th Amendment that abolished slavery to the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. But did the situation become much better? Were, did, for example, black Americans become equal to white Americans after that war and after that amendment? Of course not. Injustices persisted, which was expected, of course. Not all of a sudden, not overnight, black people are going to get all their rights and they will. They are not going to enjoy all uh, the justice that they really deserved. So there were a lot of injustices, a lot of um, tragedies that took place even after the war, that's for sure. That's what we have to keep in mind. Of course, I know that this is something I mean, very simple to say, and this is something very banal, but of course we have to say it. In, uh, of course, uh, we, uh, the South, which of course was defending slavery during the war, let me say that some states in the South after the war, during the Reconstruction era, with the 13th Amendment, there were a lot of legislation and a lot of actions by the federal government to establish some equality, some rights for, for the blacks. And African Americans started to acquire some of their rights, even political rights, during that period. And during the Reconstruction era, they uh, started to have a political role to, to, to engage in politics and decision making. In, uh, also, they, they, they started to have a number of uh, rights, including employment rights and schooling rights, etc. But very soon, there was a kind of uh, uh, retreat from these uh, accomplishments of the Civil War, and mainly in the South. Many states started to uh, probably to to deprive African Americans uh, of, of their rights, of their acquired rights after the war. This was also so. We are speaking about a kind of resistance by white supremacists. We speak about white supremacy and white supremacists. Those people who believe that whites are superior to to black people. And uh, these people, of course, resisted after the war, after the end of the war. They did not just, of course, um, get rid of all their uh, prejudices against uh, blacks. 
and resistance took different forms, including, I mean, the legislative aspect. Now, we could speak about some kind of new legislation to deprive black people, new legislation, of course, that was uh, fundamentally anti-constitutional or anti-constitutional, of course, but this really happened. Uh, new laws to deprive these people of their rights, of their civil rights, political rights, etc. Uh, what, what kind of, uh, of laws? Oh, uh, these laws, by the way, they used to be called later uh, the uh, they, they used to be called the, the Jim Crow laws. Jim Crow. Who is Jim Crow, and why were they called the Jim Crow? The Jim Crow laws. are actually laws that are rather racist laws. They were called Jim Crow after a very famous, at that time, a very famous character, theater character, played by a white man, a white actor, who used to play the role of a black man on, sta on the stage, and he, he was quite famous. And, uh, and he was trying to... Uh, to, uh, to, to incarnate uh, the character of a black man in the United States of America. I think that, uh, because of course there are not a lot of records about uh, the content of the, uh, of the plays or the performances that this man used to actually deliver on the stage, but uh, I think that his performances was, were not really 100% negative or racist. Uh, we don't really know about that, but uh, but then the uh, in one way or the other they consolidated the the stereotype against the black. So later the anti-black or the racist uh, laws the, uh, were called the Jim Crow laws, and they existed in many states in the South. They tried, as I said, to deprive blacks of their rights, including the right to vote. There was a movement of what we could call disenfranchisement. Franchisement, which means, of course, you're granting the right to vote to people. And disenfranchisement of black people that took place during this period. In addition to other, uh, of course, laws, mainly the law that consecrated and that uh, reinforced uh, segregation and discrimination. We will speak about uh, segregation mainly because at that time segregation uh, was not considered to be a kind of uh, injustice. Because segregation simply means to be separate. And there was the very famous uh, saying or motto of se separate but equal. We could be separate. You don't want to mingle with us. We can be separate, but we should be equal separate but equal, but this did not work, by the way, and you will see that later. So, uh, but in addition to the legislative uh, actions against blacks that took place in different states, because as, as you know, of course, here uh, in this union of the United States of America, we could uh, speak a kind of sometimes of opposition between what is federal and what is state uh, located, which means what is, for example, when you speak about legislation, sometimes there are contradictions, opposition between federal law and state law. Uh, and it's uh, an open debate uh, up to now. Uh, who is going to decide such an issue, this issue or that issue? Is it the federal government, the federal legisl legislation or the uh, state legislation? So, and this uh, was the debate that took place also uh, about slavery, but also about uh, the, uh, the African-American cause. Uh, is it uh, the, uh, the decision of the state or the decision of the federal government when we speak about the situation of African-Americans in the United States of America? So, in addition to the legal legislative aspect, there were also some... Uh, very violent incidents that took place against, uh, after I'm speaking again about uh, uh, the period after the war. Some uh, violent reaction by white supremacists, of course, the most famous of the uh, organization that we could speak about, and I'm sure you know it, it's the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, the KKK. 
which is rather a, a white supremacist organization. It's, you could also call it a terrorist organization. Why? Because its mission was to, uh, to kill black people, to, uh, to try to, uh, and they engaged in uh, many uh, incidents, uh, lynching uh, black people. To, um, there was, of course, lynching was widespread after that uh, period, I mean, by the end of the 19th century, the late 19th century, and the beginning of the 20th century also. What's lynching? L-Y-N-C-H-I-N-G. It means to kill, it, 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 without, uh, to execute people without any court judgment, without any court decision. It's uh, what we could call extrajudicial execution of people. Uh, execution by the mob, by the mob. By, when the mob, for example, decide that that person is a criminal and needs to be killed, and they killed him without, of course, referring to any kind of uh, judiciary system. That's what happened, for example, in Tunisia with one politician that you know. Where, where, whether the politician was right or wrong, that uh, the act itself of lynching is, is, of course, wrong. And this is why there is, in all human societies, we have, of course, um, uh, a judiciary system. Lynching, of course, as I said, was widespread in the country. Uh, black people were accused of murder, of theft, of rape, of incest, etc. Most of the time, the by the mobs, M-O-V, and uh, most of the time, these ac accusations were false, and uh, black people were killed in public in front of everyone, and there are many pictures, I mean, very bad pictures that you could find online also of such uh, uh, executions by mobs. This, for example, when I told you that uh, West, let's say, foreign media uh, were also focusing on these um, things that were happening in the United States in order to criticize the United States. I speak here about Russia, of course, the USSR, but also I speak uh, later. I'm not speaking, of course, right after the Civil War, but I'm speaking about the, the first half of this of the 20th century and also in the 1950s and 60s, because lynching, by the way, continued until this period, which is very, of course, uh, tragic. So I said, of course, uh, media, foreign media, were also focusing on such uh, uh, acts uh, in order to criticize the United States. You, the United States of America, you uh, speak in the name of values and democracy and universal rights, and human rights, but look at what, uh, what is happening inside your country between whites and blacks. Uh, so, uh, after the Civil War, there was, as I said, the 13th Amendment and also the 14th Amendment. 13th Amendment ended slavery officially, and the 14th Amendment spoke about equal protection, or let's say equality between all people. <laughs> equal protection. And uh, these were two. These two amendments, of course, were used by black advocates in order to defend the African American cause, and they were challenged by state laws, by the Jim Crow laws, and by uh, white supremacists. And uh, so, uh, the this was a kind of struggle again, a continuous struggle that continued after the uh, the, the Civil War. And we could have, of course, uh, a lot of uh, events and a lot of incidents that took place and that are related to uh, these two forces, the, uh, the forces who are uh, for um, equality, justice, and equal rights, and the forces who are against uh, these notions and these values. So because of, uh, probably because of the influence of foreign media and because of the influence of foreign op op powers who were criticizing uh, America based on the uh, African-American issue, the African-American cause, uh, there were a number of decisions taken by the government, including a very important decision taken by President uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, sorry. So, um, 
It was a decision by Franklin Roosevelt, who was, of course, as you know, one of the presidents during the WW2, uh, to be then succeeded by uh, uh, Truman. And there was a, an executive order issued by Franklin uh, Roosevelt on, uh, in, in 1941 to allow black people, to allow African Americans, but also to allow all people to apply for national defense jobs and also government jobs. And this was unprecedented in history, and it was also because the, the nation needed uh, its African American citizens. Uh, so there were some attempts uh, to contain African Americans inside, to offer jobs and to offer probably equal employment, uh, but at the same time there was resistance again, as we said. The resistance was, I think, in my opinion, that the resistance came mainly from the people, why uh, justice and equal rights uh, were uh, on the agenda, uh, on the agendas of the government, of the federal government, since Abraham Lincoln, I believe. But resistance was popular. It was among the people. People were against uh, equal rights. And the proof is, of course, what we're going to speak, uh, what we are going to speak about uh, uh, in the form of resistance, uh, in the form of segregation in schools and uh, in public facilities and buses. And there was the very famous story that I'm, I'm going to, of course, again speak about the story of Rosa Parks. I'm, I'm sure you heard about it, but it's important also to, to mention it here. The woman named Rosa Parks and the famous uh, story about the, the, the boss uh, boycott. And, you know, Rosa Parks was a woman uh, living in Montgomery, Alabama, and uh, buses there, the bus system was segregated, which means, of course, that... Uh, uh, whites and blacks did not have the same rights. Uh, but be before I speak about uh, this uh, very incident, let me uh, say in general that, of course, uh, one of the forms of uh, this popular resistance uh, uh, was, of course, segregation uh, inside the country, segregation and racial discrimination. So, uh, this was justified by the principle of separate but equal, mainly. Separate but equal. We could be separate, but we could, but we have to be equal. That's uh, a principle that that is not mentioned in the Constitution or in the amendments to the Constitution, but it was probably inspired or, or justified by the Fourteenth Amendment, which which spoke about equal protection, equal protection or equality between all people, all citizens. The Supreme Court, in very famous historical decisions, found uh, the principle of separate but equal and the principle of separation constitutional, not necessarily anti-constitutional. So you can, this is, in, I'm trying, of course, to speak in informal language, You and that's what the uh, Supreme Court used to think in the beginning, of course, that you can be separate, no problem with that. But you have just two people, which means we can have separate hospitals, separate schools, separate all the facilities that you can think about, transportation, etc. But the most important thing is to be equal, and this is not anti-constitutional. But of course, this was only in theory. In practice, there was real inequality, big disparity, big differences between the facilities and that were offered to black people and the facilities and the services that were offered to white people, including schools, for, for instance, etc. So, uh, as I said, I was, uh, this was, I mean, the, the situation. It was a situation of segregation, but also racial discrimination, and this allowed a lot of uh, uh, people to, for example, uh, to segregate restaurants uh, and bars, etc. And you can uh, find online, for example, a lot of, that, for example, signs uh, from that period that for, that blacks are not allowed, for instance, that you can find on um, in, 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 uh, on the gate or on the on the door of a restaurant or on on the door of the uh, 
cafe or, or even a theater or etc. So Rosa Parks now in this situation in, 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 in Alabama Montgomery Montgomery is the city in Alabama the state uh, there was a rule to Islam this is of course just the details of the story the rule that uh, very let's say between quotation marks stupid rule that um, uh, there were seats for black people and seats for white people but also whenever uh, a white man uh, comes on to the on to the bus and he or she, or white woman doesn't find a, a, a seat then one of the black people there should stand up and should leave his seat for to, to that man this is what uh, happened with Rosa Parks she was uh, uh, on the bus when a black man she had a seat and when the black oh when, when a white man sorry came into the bus and uh, then she was expected to uh, give him his uh, her seat and even the driver himself uh, made a kind of uh, comment uh, on that that she should actually uh, give the man her seat but she refused she said no and then she was arrested the police were was called and she was arrested because of that this was something illegal what what she committed between inverted commas and uh, this is how the story of course you can imagine how the story became uh, uh, known to all and uh, by the way she was uh, rosa parks was an activist herself this is what she was I mean, a committed woman and she used to be uh, one active member of the naacp and naacp which is a very important uh, association so uh, NNACP is an association or an organization defending equal rights and the rights of African Americans and other colored people. By the way, NAACP is an acronym standing for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Colored people. You may also wonder well, what we mean by colored people. Colored people are all people who are not white people. Well, this is very interesting, and let me probably make a comment. Uh, on this, uh, <clears throat> there's something that I discovered uh, personally, and uh, and I was really surprised when I discovered that uh, because in in my I mean understanding before I discovered that you know in my understanding white people are just white people and black people are just black people, but uh, I mean in terms of color. But in America, for example, what I discovered the interesting thing is that for example Italians are not white people. In the United States, I mean, official, uh, conventionally speaking, Italians or even Russian, imagine, Russian people are not white people in the United States. Uh, 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 really, this is what uh, some people think in the United States. <laughs> because I was once in a group of people, uh, with us there were uh, Russians and Italians, and including also Americans, etc. And I understood from the conversation they did not, uh, in, in addition to African people, and it was of course a, a mixed group of many people from all over the world, and I uh, was surprised to discover that for some Americans, even Russians or Italians are not are supposed to be white people. So white people in the United States, and in the, in the tradition, it's uh, white Anglo-Saxon the Protestant uh, people, the WASP, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. You have to be Protestant, you have to be Anglo-Saxon, and you have to be white for sure. So the colored people are all people who are not white, in, 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 according to this tradition, according to this definition. <clears throat> not only black people. Okay. Uh, so uh, the Rosa Parks incident uh, led to the Montgomery bus boycott. It's a very famous uh, uh, event that, or it's a very uh, famous, uh, let's say, incident, the Rosa Parks incident, but also the movement. It, was, it became a movement, a popular movement in the form of boycott for many and many days. They boycotted the bus system in Montgomery and it was also imitated by other uh, uh, regions, uh, boycotting facilities, not only buses. Boycott in a lot of facilities and a lot of uh, uh, services uh, because of racism, because of segregation, 
and uh, of course the objective of boycott as you know is uh, to threaten uh, this business uh, in, uh, economically and this is what really happened because the the bus system depended on the revenues coming from the money of African Americans in, in this area. <clears throat> so, as I said, uh, the principle of separate but equal, which could sound, let's say, um, fair to some people, it, it, it was not really implemented as it is, and there were big differences between. Uh, facilities and services for blacks and those for whites. So, uh, in addition to uh, boycott, uh, the boycott, which became co cultural, uh, I mean, in, in America, the, uh, we know about the culture of boycott in, in India, the very famous boycott uh, conducted by Indian resistance of the British colonizer and the very famous Gandhi. And this leads us probably to a uh, very interesting, this is why in the beginning I said the African-American poor and the African-American struggle and the civil rights movement is also a lesson for all humanity about how to resist injustice, of course, that's the lesson. It's about how to deal with injustice when you are the victim of injustice. So this led in America to a debate among African-Americans themselves about how to, to resist, how to defend our rights. Uh, and the two points of view is whether we should use violence or not. So, of course, when uh, you are a victim of violence, sometimes it's very natural to react violently and to defend yourself violently. That's what happens, of course, most of the time. And But there was also another opinion that... Uh, of course, believed and that still believes today that uh, to react violently is not going to be beneficial at all, and you have to resist injustice in a non-violent way, and that's what we call non-violent, non-violence, uh, non-violence, the principle of non-violence or non-violent resistance. Well, cotton, for example, is a non-violent, of course, is a form of non-violent resistance. Why I remember this one when speaking about India, because of course the very famous Indian leader Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, was of course a man who believed a man who believed in non-violent resistance and pacifism. Uh, in the United States and during the civil rights movement, there were two big leaders. Each one of them represented one approach. Non-violent resistance, of course, was the approach of Martin Luther King Jr. that you know about for sure, the, the, the famous man with that very famous speech, I Have a Dream. He was a churchman and he believed in uh, non-violent resistance. But there was also another man, another leader who is very famous also, and his name is Malcolm X. Malcolm X, who believed in violent resistance. Uh, one of the slogans, for example, was the ballot or the bullet, which means the, ba the ballot, of course, which means, of course, elections, the box, <coughs> the ballot box, whether you give us our right to, in other words, to translate that slogan, the ballot or the bullet, whether you give us our right to vote or we're going to use violence, the bullet, okay? And so it's obvious that this is the opposite approach. And of course, I'm speaking here about the two leaders, but of course, each leader ha had his own followers and his own uh, uh, his own militants also, etc., and his uh, own people. But the interesting, well, the sad thing is that both of them were killed. That both of them were assassinated by white supremacists. Uh, whether the, the one who believed in non-violence or the one who believed in violence. Malcolm X was assassinated in 1965 and Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968. So, uh, well, well, so the form of non-violent resistance, uh, the for many forms of non-violent resistance were uh, sit-ins also, sit-in, uh, and boycotts, um, 
and other forms of protest, of course, and non-violent protests, including marches, to conduct marches, the very famous of which the most important and the most famous march that uh, took place during the civil rights movement without any uh, doubt is, of course, the mar what we call the March on Washington. It was called the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. This too, it was a big march of uh, uh, over 200,000 people who went to Washington, D.C. to protest and to call for equal jobs and to call for freedom. They were, of course, mainly African-Americans, but be careful, we have also to say, this is, of course, about the African-American cause, but also there were a lot of white people with them, of course. Well, a lot of white people who believed in uh, the freedom of African Americans and in, uh, who believed in equality between whites and blacks, and this is very normal, of course. Uh, this march, a very important march, of course, uh, as I said, it's called the March on Washington, it's very famous, and it uh, took place on August the 28th, 1963. So, as I said, boycotts, uh, marches, peaceful protests, sit-ins, etc. These were the forms of nonviolent resistance that took place. And the march on Washington was probably one of the biggest manifestations of this nonviolent resistance. Well, uh, of course, uh, no need to go into the details or to speak about all incidents and all boycotts, etc. But that's in general, of course, what took place. But what we have to keep in mind out of all this is the achievements what the, the achievements of this movement because there uh, throughout these 15 or 16 uh, years or more from 1954 to 1968 <coughs> sorry 14 years or uh, 16 years etc so, uh, during these uh, years, of course, there were different developments in legislation, the, uh, well, the, the rights, when we speak about uh, calling for our rights, when people are calling for their rights, of course, their rights should be uh, in the law. And um, the, uh, so what we have to know, uh, uh, what we have actually to study in order to see if they really actually realize the objective or not, we have to see how the laws evolved. We said that we had the uh, 13th Amendment and the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, but these were not enough. You know, uh, with so the results of the civil rights movement were in the form of new legislations. They were mainly called the Civil Rights Acts, different Civil Rights Acts about the different tribes of these people, but also there were also court rulings or court decisions, the decisions by courts, because many of these issues went to court, whether we're speaking about the Supreme Court, which is the highest uh, court, federal court in the country, or other courts, you know, the, the, how the, the judiciary system is uh, organized in the United States, like all other systems, like the police system, like the legislative system, we have what is federal and what is state, uh, local. So uh, there, there were different court decisions in favor of uh, the civil rights movement, in favor of these civil rights for all people, for black people. Uh, let me mention some of the most famous uh, court decisions. By the way, Something is interesting about court decisions uh, in the United States is that we call them after the names of the people who were, I mean, the litigants, what we call litigants, which means the people who were uh, uh, in the dispute inside the court. Uh, you know, in any court case, in any lawsuit, you have two people who, who are against each other, two groups of people or two individuals who are against each other. Uh, we call them uh, the plaintiff, and the defense, the one who is complaining to the court, when you when you think that there is some injustice against you, you go to the court to complain. And the other person is going to defend himself. So there are two parties, two people or two groups of people with their lawyers, etc. And the interesting thing that many 
court decisions and court cases in the United States of America are named after these two people, their real names, okay? which is very interesting. Like the very famous, sorry, <coughs> like the very famous, I uh, remember, for example, the Scopes trial, and the, the Scopes uh, case, a man was named Scope, and it was about a teacher who, uh, who was teaching evolution, Darwinian evolution at school, and some uh, people uh, thought that this was illegal, and there was a court decision and court case about that before the court decision. So I said one of the interesting court cases was called the Brown versus Board of Education case, or the Brown versus Board of Education court decision. This uh, was in 1954. Brown versus Board of Education. So we have um, a family name, Brown, and they, it was a family of black people. They had children, but in addition to other children from other families, because they joined each other in this case, who actually sued the Board of Education. They sued the Board of Education because they thought that uh, the issue is that, of course, there was segre a segregated system of education, schools for black children and schools for white children. So the Brown uh, versus Board of Education actually originated in the state of Kansas, and uh, it was a segregated educational system, as, uh, as I said. And, and then uh, the, the family wanted to actually enroll their children in, in a school that, is, that was a nearby school, so close to their home, but they refused. The Board of Education refused because of, of the segregation system, of course. And they uh, they told them that you need to enroll your children in another school, which was, of course, very far away from their home. This is why they went to court. And then from the local court, the case went to the Supreme Court of the United States of America. The good uh, thing, of course, by the end is that the case, of course, uh, 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 made, of course, a separation and segregation uh, illegal. And they said that this... Uh, segregation, <coughs> sorry, that the segregation system, that the segregated school system was illegal according to the Supreme Court in 1954. So, so this was a, a first victory of this uh, of the civil rights movement for equal uh, education, equal schooling, etc. So what we are speaking about uh, here when we speak about such cases like the Brown versus uh, court, uh, Board of Education uh, is very interested in law, actually. We're, we're speaking about law, we're speaking about legislations, and as you know, you may say, why do, why do we need such uh, cases in order to know what is right and what is wrong according to the law? Because the, the law is a human-made, it's a man-made text, and as you, many, I'm sure you heard about gaps in the law, gaps in the law, because the law cannot cover everything. There are a lot of gaps, and this is, a, by the way, they say, some people say this is the job of lawyers to know where the gaps are in, in order to, to, to benefit from these gaps and to, 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 to find a solution in, in the case. So, of course, laws are not comprehensive. They do not cover everything, and this is, so this is why we always need amendments to laws, to the Constitution, but also we need new legislations. But in addition to amendments and new legislations, which mean uh, new laws, new laws, to, to enact new laws, but also in addition to that, there are also gaps or, let's say, ambiguity about the interpretation of the law. You have a law, but you may have different treatments of the same law. And the court is supposed to, to implement the law, to apply the law. But... Uh, what about having different interpretations of the law? This is why we have different dif different court decisions sometimes about the same issue. And so what we are speaking about when we speak about these important law cases, lawsuits, it's, it's sometimes this, is, this happens everywhere in every country, including Indonesia, for instance. So sometimes you wait for a court decision in order to know what would happen after that, which means that court decision will be an example to be followed later. That's very interesting about law. I repeat, the idea is that we are in front of, of a law, 
This law may have different interpretations. How are we going to know the right interpretation of that law? Who, is, who has the right to say this is the right interpretation? Of course, it's the, the, the judiciary system, and the, we have different layers, different levels of the ju judiciary system. And of course, the highest level is the one that has the last word. Highest level is the Supreme Court in the United States of America. In Tunisia, we're going to have the constitutional court, which is going to be the highest level <coughs> of the judiciary system. So, um, let me probably stop here. We will continue next time. So, stay safe and see you next time. Thank you very much.